What's that? <laughs> That's blame it on Val. Val, when you took off your headset, we got a bunch of static. So there's something. It was going Val on. catching fire or something. Yeah. So how hey, about it, Val? It's still a little staticky. There you go. Yeah. It's hey. odd. Hmm. Muted. <laughs> So Val, I talked with uh, with Rick earlier today. Um, great job on the CTE brief. Really looking forward to that tomorrow. Yeah, we uh, we had a good time on Saturday putting that together. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah, you still got some static on your audio. Okay, I don't know why because I I'm no longer on the the headset. So are you wi wireless or? Uh... No, I'm just going right through the speaker or the microphone on my camera. Weird. All righty. Well, I shouldn't be speaking now, anyhow. So. <laughs> I bet you it's the it's the plug. It's probably yeah. got some little uh, stuff on it. Yeah. Is that is that is that a experience from your Walkman days, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> See, Jordan doesn't even know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're muted. I can't hear you. You yelling at me right now. Oh, I, I still have a plug-in set of gaming speakers on the uh, the computer at home that my my kids used to use. <laughs> it always goes. Oh, I just got to jiggle it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. So, um, Bruce, should I get this? Um, I get it's, this going. Yes, um, just after for you. So. Great, great. I know we've got um, a good group of attendees, so uh, excited for that. And thanks for um, uh, uh, to Val and, and Bill for being and Kareen for being able to join today. So um, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the commission's uh, extended public comment session. Um, and uh, today is what the what, wow November twenty eighth, and we're just after four o'clock. Um, Dave, it's October for the record here. Oh, November! I was I was flipping the flipping the. You just the, panicked uh, me! You panicked me! Had. No, no, I'm I can't wait till November twenty eighth. <laughs> you know, you got you even have Thanksgiving in the rearview mirror by that point, probably. So, uh, anyway, um, let's see. Uh, just wanted to a um, uh, couple of introductory remarks here. I mean, this isn't the, this is an opportunity. I think where where we can. Um, you know, expand the amount of time uh, to hear from members of the community, members of uh, of the public, to let us know what's on their mind. It's it's really not a um, uh, you know an opportunity for extended uh, or extensive um, presentations or anything like that. If you've got something that you really want to bring um, forward to the to the commission, that's uh, that's new and groundbreaking and stuff like that, um, uh, you know. The, you know, reach out to, to Bruce and and, uh, and me and, and uh, we can certainly talk about scheduling uh, uh, something like that. But obviously at this point, we're on the, uh, the, uh, the glide path towards our December 1st reporting, expected reporting date. So, um, so uh, anyway, um, uh, I also usually sort of make a couple notes. We do have a very, very extensive public engagement process, which is working with uh, with stakeholders and various groups from uh, from all across the state. So hopefully, uh, everybody's also had opportunity to participate um, in those. And then I guess um, uh, everybody uh, on uh, on the line. I think people are pretty pretty much familiar with. Our uh, our group agreements that uh, that uh, are really sort of laid around uh, listening and respect, and uh, we certainly expect uh, that will uh, will continue as it has um, uh, all year long. And I guess finally, this is public comment, not really a, a Q and A uh, session. And um, and you can you can certainly always um, you know send uh, send questions uh, or or for clarification. Uh, uh, to um, to Bruce or, or me, or you can uh, email uh, questions, comments to uh, the commission um, at uh, school funding, all one word, dot commission at unh.edu. And you can also see the uh, collection of uh, public comment from the uh, the commission website at carsey, C-A-R-S-E-Y dot unh.edu slash school dash funding. So um, anyway, 
with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Jordan, who's going to uh, handle the um, the uh, the doorway here. And um, and I think the the idea is raise your hand um, on Zoom, uh, and uh, we'll let you in. And if um, if you're on a phone, uh, I don't see any dial-ins, but I think it would be star nine. Um, so, um, uh, Jordan, over to you. A any access issues? Anything like that? Nope, I uh, haven't heard anything. We've got a robust uh, 20 folks here this afternoon, which is awesome. And I already see about six hands raised. So Great, great. Over to you, Jordan. All right. So we'll get them in the order that they were received. And so first we have Jeff McLynch. Jeff, welcome. Uh, Jeff, thank welcome. You. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Luno, members of the commission, thanks so much for the chance to appear before you this afternoon. Uh, for the record, my name is Jeff McLynch and I'm the project director of the New Hampshire School Funding Fairness Project, a nonprofit organization that seeks to educate citizens and policymakers about the system New Hampshire uses to fund its public schools, to build awareness of the shortcomings of that system, and to advocate for changes in law that make that system more fair for students and taxpayers alike. Uh, now, as all of you know, throughout its deliberations to date, the commission has grappled with a number of fundamental questions related to school funding, questions ranging from the degree of state responsibility for an adequate education to the most effective approach for devising a more uniform and more equitable source of revenue to support our public schools. In the weeks ahead, the commission will need to agree upon its answers to those questions and articulate the principles that will form the basis for its final recommendations. So with that in mind, I appear before the commission today in partnership with a number of other educational and civic organizations from across New Hampshire to present the commission with a statement of principles. And our hope is that this statement will inform the commission's remaining work and provide a helpful guide as it crafts its recommendations, recommendations that really hold the potential to completely recast New Hampshire's school funding system and to address at long last the educational and economic disparities that have plagued our state for decades. I've shared the complete text of the statement along with a full list of the supporting organizations with the commission already via the Carsey Schools email address. So in the interest of time, I'll try to cover each and every one of the principles that includes, but there are two in particular I wanna to call to the commission's attention. Uh, first and foremost, the commission's final recommendation should once and for all fulfill the responsibility of the state of New Hampshire to meet in full the costs of providing an adequate education for every child, regardless of where they live. Indeed, the Supreme Court has made the extent of the state's responsibility abundantly clear, ruling in the 2006 Londonderry case that whatever the state identifies as comprising constitutional adequacy, it must pay for. None of that financial obligation can be shifted to local school districts, regardless of their relative wealth or need. And several legal experts have appeared before the commission since January and have explained and affirmed the court's position on this matter and the state's responsibility as a result. Um, consequently, the commission must acknowledge that responsibility and ensure that its recommendations make good on it. And I should hasten to add, uh, however, that the cost of providing constitutional adequacy is likely to vary from district to district, depending upon both the attributes of each district and the students within it. And I think the work that AIR has done on behalf of the commission certainly underscores uh, that point. Second, in devising a system to meet that core responsibility for the state, the commission's recommendations should rely upon a revenue source that is uniform in rate throughout New Hampshire. And as each of you know well, that is clearly not the case today. School property tax rates vary widely from community to community, with families in some parts of the state paying considerably more in property taxes than families elsewhere, even as their children enjoy considerably fewer educational opportunities. Whatever path the commission may set in its recommendations, it cannot lead to these same disparate outcomes. Uh, I'm joined today by four individuals, each representing organizations that support the full set of principles. Barrett Christina, the Executive Director of the New Hampshire School Boards Association. Megan Tuttle, the President of NEA New Hampshire. Bridie Bellamare, Executive Director of the New Hampshire Association of School Principals. Carl Ladd, the Executive Director of the New Hampshire School Administrators Association. And I hope that um, they can be recognized as well to offer their own concerns about New Hampshire's existing school funding system as well as their views about the substance of the commission's final report. Uh, just as I conclude my remarks, I do wanna thank each of the members of the commission for their dedication and service and urge each of them once more 
to make the most of this tremendous generational opportunity and ensure that the recommendations to which they'll ultimately put their names are comprehensive, lasting, and fair. Thank you so much again. Great, thank you very much, Jeff, for, uh, for sharing that. And, um, and we did, um, uh, I think members of the commission did receive the, um, the memo that, um, that you, you referenced, so. Terrific. Okay. Now the next person is up to talk is Esther Kennedy. Welcome, Esther. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Esther Kennedy, and I'm in a unique situation where not only am I a public school administrator in the Guilford schools. Um, as a director of student service, so I deal with special needs, 504s, ESOL, um, Title IX, Title I, the works. Um, but I also happen to be a city councilor in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And the reason I'm dialing in is um, we heard in our legislative committee about your plan, the draft plan, by uh, Ms. Christina Dwyer, who sits on your committee task force. And as she was going through the plan, I asked her a few questions that kind of come out of my role as a public school administrator in student services. Um, and she said, no one has really asked that. So I've been asked by the city to kind of join this and kind of give you a couple of ideas and thoughts and, and maybe have an opportunity to express some thoughts about the way we look at school funding in New Hampshire as kind of someone that has their boots on the ground in two communities and um, has a little bit of insight. I've been in my position as Director of Student Services now for 23 years. And the couple of things I wanted to bring up is educating individuals in um, our public schools and in our communities about things like federal funds. If you remember two years ago, um, the Commissioner of Education shared with the public through the union leader and other resources that $10 million got left on the table by, in the special arena of special ed. And if you look at the schools that got put in the union leader, um, they were schools, unfortunately, that could have used some support on how to fill out the federal grants and how to work with the federal grants and how to deal with federal grants. And we find out recently there's some extra money in Title I and in um, Title IV, some of the other grants, which I happen to write in my district. Um, and, and they are, can be, there is a trick to them. There is um, a little complication and, and they can be um, a little interesting to follow and keep up on. So I guess as part of this commission, with all these federal funds, and, and that's not even to mention the Medicaid funds or, um, what you so eloquently called the catastrophic funds in your report. However, now it's called the special ed aid funds. Um, so I would recommend you change that in your report. But, um, you know, there is a trick, to be honest with you, and I'm, and I'm it's a little callous word, to doing that and to gathering those funds and, and receiving those funds. So I guess with what I'd like to suggest today is part of your document and your plan is how are you going to support schools in making sure they access all the funds that they can potentially access um, from the federal government, from our state government, and maybe even some of some of our corporations? Um, where is that part of the plan? I didn't see that in the plan, but I know there's a lot of money out there. And I happened to watch your meeting just to kind of see what direction you're going, um, not this past Monday, but the Monday before. And I realized some of it was special needs funding. So there is money being left on the table. And as a mentor to many directors, I also teach graduate classes at Plymouth University in the area of special needs. Um, I find that somewhere people need to help and, and pull that money in so we don't lose that money. And that should be part of this plan. And the other thing I, I brought as a, a center of concern is that when we look at school funding and look at the per student um, rate of education. In some cases, school districts that are trying to do a really nice job in keeping their children in the district um, and not sending them to out-of-district placements that can cost anywhere from 
50,000 to upwards of 300,000, um, we kind of get penalized as part of the school funding. Because if we send a child out of district that can be quite costly, they might have multitudes of disabilities, then we don't, that isn't part of our per student ratios. But if I spend a lot of money and keep that child in a district, which is appropriate for the child, the family, and the school and our community, and we get them to understand the community, and it's gonna cost a little bit more money to keep that child in our district than the average child, that becomes part of our per student funding. So a district like mine that works really hard and has really expertise and experience educators, and we're able to keep every child in our district, knock on wood right now, we don't have any children in our district placement. And most districts our size has around 20. Um, you know, we're being penalized at, at our student cost because we're doing those extra fun, extra needs to keep that child in our district. However, if I just placed all these children, my cost per student would be a lot less for my district. So I'm hoping that when you start thinking about what true costs are, and I saw that you were, you were kind of alluding this in the last um, time you were meeting, or when I watched you, and I really appreciate that, that you were doing that work. You really think of everything, because I can tell you that um, the best thing for every child is to keep them in their home district. And sometimes it takes a little extra money to do that. But uh, if I did send them to an out-of-district placement, um, even if I send them to something like, because a lot of districts now have to send to Massachusetts, we're looking at $250,000 per child. That doesn't co come into my cost. And so I technically am not penalized for that child. So I don't want us to put something in place that would encourage something that would not be best for children. So those okay. were some of my two big thoughts. Um, I will continue to be interested in watching your draft. I wasn't really in tuned until I was uh, given the honor of information from uh, Ms. Dwyer. But um, I think, I hope that when you, as you're working through this, you really talk to, I know there's administrators, I saw the task force that are on it, but you talk to those people that have boots on the ground that are, that are working every day in this. And if we can do anything to educate schools and help some of these school districts spend their federal funds um, and looking at bringing in federal funds. I mean, when I look at the list, that was put out Esther. on January 7th in 2019 and the union leader, the schools, some of the schools there, are some of the schools that probably need the most help. So I wanna thank you for your time. Just wanted to bring up those points. Thanks. And if you have any question, you know where I am. Thanks. Terrific, thanks very much, Esther. Okay, next hand up is Deglin. Welcome, Deglin. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Chairman Leno and, and the committee. I, I really appreciate the work you've done, and I will endeavor to be brief. And uh, I am a Portsmouth City Councilor. I am not here as a city councilor today, but as a parent, a parent to a four-year-old with another one coming any day now uh, who cares not just about the education my daughters are going to receive in Portsmouth, but the education that kids receive across the state. Education is an equalizer, and it's allowed me, the, uh, the grandson of, of somebody we like to say graduated the fifth grade, um, to deliver these marks uh, to you today. I commend you for spending as much time as you have uh, on this much need committee. Education is something that parents of means can solve without going to the ballot box. They either move or send their kids to private school. For the rest, they're relying on the decisions we collectively make as a state. and really for, in a lot of ways, the report that you guys are, are tasked with, with presenting. Having read the AR report, uh, the draft of that, I just wanted to call attention to a few points that I believe to need to be improved uh, before it's finalized. Uh, the report seems to operate with property wealth as a stand-in for wealth, uh, as if our houses were fungible commodities, able to be sold easily and without attachment. The only fungible commodity New Hampshire residents have access to is cash. To act as somebody's wealth is defined by their property is a regressive way to frame the conversation. One line jumped out. Uh, in other words, districts with less property wealth should not have to tack themselves at higher rates to achieve similar levels of funding. 
And I ask why not? Certainly if those taxpayers are less able to afford those taxes, taxes I would agree, but stated as facts assumes the property itself and not the property owner are paying the taxes. Which brings me to another point uh, and concern that I have with the report, using free and reduced lunch as a stand-in for poverty. While the report goes to some length to describe this as only applicable to children, it is easy for the reader to use it as representative community wealth. Free and reduced lunch doesn't account for a community that has seen a rise in property values, sometimes dramatically over the last 30 years. This could make it cost prohibitive for young families to move in, only making room for wealthy families as based on income. This metric leaves out taxpayers who do not have school-aged children and might be buckling under the property tax burden that continues to grow well past their ability to pay. Finally, when it comes to property tax, I've heard many describe it as steady and reliable, but I would urge you to also include the language of unrelenting. The property tax does not factor your ability to pay in all but a few circumstances. And in those circumstances, I believe there's an opportunity. The municipal level is able to offer property value reductions to senior and disabled persons through an income qualification. I'd urge the community to understand the role of property tax circuit breakers so that education funding problem you hope to solve doesn't do so on the backs of those least able to pay. To not do so will pit communities against one another and lead them divided amongst themselves when we should be united in delivering an education to our next generation. Thank you all so very much. And I really do appreciate the work you're, you're putting in. Great, thank, thank you so much for sharing your comments, Dagon. Okay, the next person on our list, uh, they may be on their phone or computer. It just says owner, so. We're bringing you in. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. This is Don Moyer from the town of Hill. Um, the, Welcome, Don. The, yeah, thank you. Um, the topic I want to talk about, the 30-minute video that came out with the lights, camera, action was a very impactful message, very well done. In the final five minutes, John Tobin talks about the topic of how the current system discourages uh, regional cooperation, consolidation of small schools. Our situation here, we have our own district, 50 students. The neighboring district actually has four other elementary schools. So I'm sitting in a town that has five elementary schools in a 12 mile radius. But we hit all the problems that our town has high cost drivers that why would the neighboring town ever consider? It's just all the issues that John raised. So my question or point is in the um, list of 28 critical questions you're just addressing, Question 22 kind of sits on both sides of the fence. You neither want to discourage, if I'm reading it right, neither want to discourage consolidation, nor do you want to encourage current co-ops from abandoning that. I personally believe that small school consolidation is critical. I think it's inevitable. I don't think that small town New Hampshire will ever vote to close its schools. I think it can only come from statewide mandates. And frankly, I don't know whether the state would have the power and authority to do that or whether they would enforce it if they could. But I truly believe that small school consolidation is critical and needs to needs to happen. I'd like to understand what the position is clearer than what question 22 addresses. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Don. Okay, our next speaker is Mark. Welcome. Welcome, Mark. How about yep. now? Can you hear me? Yep, yep, we got you. Welcome. Mr. Chairman, my name is Mark Dakota. I'm the town manager in Waterville Valley. Mm -hmm. I want to raise a consideration impacting education funding, which I'm not sure the commission has discussed yet. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed the education landscape here in New Hampshire in many ways. Remote learning, hybrid in-person schedules, and other terms have quickly become commonplace uh, in school dis discussions at every level uh, all across the state. 
Another education area where the pandemic has had an impact, at least in some communities, is in student population. Here in Waterville Valley, we've seen our school population rise to a record 60 students at the start of this school year. This isn't in and of itself a large number. However, when you consider that the uh, school district set its school year 2020-2021 budget based on an estimated census of 20 students, this is triple what we budgeted for. This level of growth occurred over a period of less than four months. Um, so the school district has had little uh, time to react uh, and they have taken some great steps. They've, and they have uh, really worked hard on this uh, issue. However, this um, large increase that we have seen has had a drastic effect on the expenditures within our school district. The impact has been nearly 20% increase in the estimated budget for the school year. Additionally, the district faces the unknown of how many of these students will stay for the 2021-2022 school year and beyond. And how many of these additional students, um, how many additional students on top of this increase could come to the school if the pandemic continues or changes in some way? I mean, this has been a catastrophic event for many small communities in our state. The fiscal impact on our community is not limited to the school budget. Our full-time resident population has increased by approximately 20% since January of this year. And we have seen an increase in municipal demand for municipal services, such as water and sewer, by a corresponding amount. All of these factors have put pressure on our annual budget for this year, and they will put pressure on our budgets into 2021 and beyond. We believe the commission should take into consideration the Im impact of the pandemic related population changes that have occurred in our state. This is a uh, particularly important issue for small tourist-based communities in the northern part of New Hampshire. Um, we um, also would like to point out that the population growth um, related to the pandemic does not come with any appreciable change in our property values and no immediate change in our property values. So all of the additional costs that we are seeing are hitting current taxpayers without any real increase in ability to pay. We believe that in the aggregate, this could have the bear, uh, a bearing on any education funding formula that is developed within the state in the near term and in the future. And we believe that without an investigation of these impacts, any recommendations on funding formula changes may have unintended consequences. Thank you very much for your consideration of our concerns. We appreciate it. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, and and thank you for sharing um, not only the concerns but the uh, but you, you know the um, uh, changes that you're seeing in Waterville Valley. That's very um, uh, informative. So thanks very much for your time. Okay, next we have Robert. Welcome, Robert. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Um, <clears throat> this won't take long. I just have an idea. Um, everything that you're talking about, I fully support. The question is, where is the state going to get the funding for all of this stuff? And my proposal is, and I'm trying to get a legislator to submit this to the legislature, is to add a statement in the state constitution, which says, if the state ever establishes a sales tax or an income tax, it can be for one purpose and one purpose only, 
to reduce property taxes by the same amount the fund raises. And what that does is number one, it opens up an opportunity to develop the revenue that the state is gonna need. But number two, it puts it in a lock box um, because it can't be added to because of the constitution. And the third thing is, is that before this could be get added to the constitution, it takes a two thirds majority vote of the elector of the voters in a general election. So if it passes, then the state knows that it has the backing of the public to do what they need to do to raise money to fund all of the things that we're talking about. I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are on that. So Robert, um, you know, thanks for thanks for your comment on that. The the important of these the, the importance behind these these comments is to hear what's important uh, to you, and um, you know, when it comes to um, to to this sort of issue, uh, I'm sure there will be discussions as there are um, and and as there have been uh, in the legislature, um, uh, and and you know that this is really a tax policy. Uh, question, but I appreciate you sharing your um, your idea with with um, with us. So, I was hoping that I could get the committee's support in this if it gets to the legislature. Okay, well, th thanks for sharing that. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is. Uh, is Barrett, Christina, I'm not sure if, mm -hmm. uh, which direction. Hey Barrett, welcome. Uh, good, thank you, uh, Chairman Luno, members of the uh, commission, uh, Barrett, Christina from the New Hampshire School Boards Association. Um, appreciate the opportunity to provide a, a few comments from the School Boards Association representing 160 school boards and about 900 school board members from across the state. Um, first, want to thank um, each of the, the commission members for their time and effort and looking back on the, the, the dedicated website, I see how many meetings there are and how many documents there are and um, the, uh, the effort that everybody's been put through to, to, to help um, the substantial issue for not just the state of New Hampshire, but primarily our children um, is imperative. So um, I'd like to make a couple of comments and follow up um, on a couple of the issues um, that Mr. McLynch from the New Hampshire School Funding Fairness Project mentioned relative to the statement of principles. And uh, I, I pulled a couple of those specifically that NHSBA significantly supports. Um, the first is that um, uh, supporting the effort of the commission to study school funding to find a permanent and lasting solution um, to this pair of urgent and profound matters. Um, the New Hampshire School Boards Association has a specific resolution on this adopted um, actually pre Claremont um, in 1994 that NHSBA proposes that the state fully fund all state education aid formulas before funding any other state obligation. Um, and also most importantly, as it relates directly to the work of this commission, the NHSBA supports a continual review of all costs associated with providing the opportunity for an adequate education. Uh, the second point I'd like to make um, relative to the principles from uh, the, the funding uh, fairness project is that to urge the commission to be bold and visionary and undeterred by political considerations um, or immediate fiscal and economic conditions. Uh, one of the concerns that NHSBA has um, with um, some of the, the documents and reports and discussions that have been had is that we seem to be looking at the same input relative to funding. And we're concerned that if we have the same input relative to funding, we're gonna have the same output relative to how that comes down um, with, with respect to, to local school districts. Um, you know, if we change the input though, um, you know, perhaps we can get a different output relative to how funding is distributed to our school districts across New Hampshire. Um, but most importantly, NHSBA would urge the commission to leave nothing off the table and consider all, all possible ideas as to how uh, the funding uh, challenge can be um, amended or changed to make it more equitable for, for students and taxpayers across the state. 
Um, last, uh, I'm sorry, not last, but uh, continuing on, um, one of the other um, principles from the, the commission that NHSBA signed, or excuse me, from the project that NHSBA signed off on um, is that it requires the state to, um, to fulfill its constitutional responsibilities and pay the cost of an adequate education for every child in the state, regardless of where they live. I point uh, commission, committee members uh, to RSA 189 colon one. That states that it's the responsibility of local school districts to be for providing uh, the education in those communities. Uh, and that applies to all school districts across the state. It doesn't matter uh, where you live or what your tax base is like or how much funding you get from the state or how little you get from the state or how much is made locally. Every school board in the state is obligated to provide uh, an education to the children who live in that community. Uh, and and the important aspect relative to what this commission is doing um, impacts uh, that statute, impacts all the school boards across the state. Um, so please bear in mind that this is, a, 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 as you have been, um, a continuous statewide issue. Um, and last, uh, I know it may be outside of sort of the, um, the, the charge, the legislative charge um, of this commission, um, but we certainly hope um, that any final report uh, of the commission will not just look at adequacy, but will look at the entire scheme of uh, school funding in New Hampshire, specifically um, recent cuts uh, over the last decade to the New Hampshire retirement system that have had a, a significant um, impact on school district budgets, the state's continued uh, underfunding of special education programs um, for decades on end, um, and numerous unfunded mandates not included in adequacy, um, but yet have significant cost impacts. Um, there have been many bills the last couple of years that have had cost impacts on school districts, but have not been put in the adequacy uh, statute, so there's no concurrent funding with that. Um, and obviously, building aid, um, you know, the the, the billions and billions of dollars of building aid that have been cut from from school funding um, over the last decade. So if a district needs to, um, you know, bond, repair, add, renovate, uh, again, that's that's coming down to local local costs, uh, local taxpayers. And so I understand not all of these have a direct impact on on the definition of adequacy or the cost of adequacy. Um, we can't look at these issues um, individually or in their own silos, because at the end of the day, they all impact school district budgets, they all impact local property taxes, and most importantly, they all impact the ability of our school district to provide adequate uh, education to our children. So um, that concludes my statements. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much for sharing, uh, uh, sharing those comments, Barrett. Okay, our next speaker will be Megan. Welcome, Megan. Hello, Chairman Luna, thank you for having me. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Megan Tuttle. I'm the president for NEA New Hampshire. Our union represents over 17,000 educators across our state in collective bargaining. In addition to negotiating and representing school staff and faculty, we also provide our members high quality professional development and raise money for scholarships and basic needs for our students. Before I begin, I would like to thank each one of you for your service on this committee and to the legislators who pushed to form this commission. While our educators and students are all facing the crisis before us now with triaging how to educate during the pandemic, the long-term crisis of school funding remains a fundamental threat to our children's education that must be addressed. In fact, the pandemic, in my opinion, has only underscored the need to come together and find solutions to this decades old puzzle. I would also like to thank the Carsey Institute for including NEA New Hampshire as part of the stakeholder listening sessions it has conducted it's been our pleasure to help aid the commission by circulating educator surveys and providing data to the commission so that it has the information it needs to complete its work successfully. As you move into the final phases of producing your roadmap forward, I wanted to come here on behalf of NEA New Hampshire, along with my colleagues in public education to support the school funding principles that Mr. McLynch outlined. I would like to focus on two aspects of this statement of principles. First, NEA New Hampshire has always operated under the principle that every child in New Hampshire, regardless of their zip code or background, deserves the right to a high quality public education. Whether you live in Berlin or Moultonboro, each child has a limitless, limitless potential and should be given an equal opportunity to achieve that potential 
using the greatest tool we have at our disposal, our public education system. To that end, we urge this committee to be bold. As I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks, in spite of the tremendous headwinds and chaos that surrounds our communities, this school funding crisis will persist long after the COVID-19 pandemic is over, unless we act as a state to fix it. The pandemic has further laid bare the inequities and resources in our system. For example, I've heard numerous stories this past year of students and educators driving to spaces with public Wi-Fi in order to take part in remote instruction, or in the case of the educator, to conduct the instruction themselves. Basic safety inequities from the ability of a school district to provide adequate cleaning products, air quality systems, shields, and other personal protective equipment is impacted by whether you live in a property rich or property poor community. Pre-pandemic, these costs and issues with funding from an educator standpoint held less unique but equally probla problematic consequences that must be addressed in a comprehensive manner as outlined in the statement of principles. We need to account for the cost of a modern education. Whether it is in person or remote schooling, we must account for the staff truly necessary to provide a robust education. That includes accounting for the cost of salaries for teachers beyond their probationary status. That in also includes the cost for the support staff needed to run a school and to support students' social emotional well being. Now, more than ever, we need to account for the costs of maintaining school buildings that are safe for our students and staff. When kids enter school, they are not all at the same starting line. Each day, we try our best to bridge that gap. Funding helps. As educators and parents, we believe teaching and caring for the whole child means a student enters school healthy and learns about practices learns about and practices a healthy lifestyle. It means they learn in an environment that's physically and emotionally safe for students and adults. It means it engages in learning and is connected to the school and broader community. It means a student gains access to personalized learning and is supported by qualified caring adults. And it also means a student is challenged academically and prepared for success in college or further study and for employment and participation in the global environment. When we take a comprehensive view on what resources are necessary to educate our kids, it will help to ensure that we stop presenting a false set of choices to the students, educators, and taxpayers of our state. Students can get a robust set of supports and curriculum regardless of the district they live in. Educators can make a salary that enables them to gain experience and grow in the profession, whether they teach in an affluent community on the seacoast or in a rural town up north. Taxpayers can know that providing adequate public education in New Hampshire does not mean making the choice between funding necessary programs and losing your home. All these needs are statewide and should be accounted for when contemplating the responsibility around funding that the state of New Hampshire must provide. As the court has said, it is the state's responsibility to fund an adequate education and that must be at the core of the solutions you develop. So to reiterate, we're asking you to be comprehensive in your approach and bold in your solutions. The roadmap you lay out will need to stand the test of time, regardless of economic and political swings. And if the change is not meaningful, I fear it will never have a chance of garnering the support it needs to pass. During these final stages before your report is ready, please continue to look to NEA New Hampshire as one of the resources at your disposal to ensure we can truly provide a high quality education to every student in New Hampshire. Thank you. Thanks very much, Megan, for, for sharing those, uh, those remarks. Okay, our next speaker will be Paul. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Paul DeShane again. Welcome, uh, welcome Paul. Representing the town of, of uh, Newington. And uh, I, I won't speak at length uh, today because uh, uh, we had some of that opportunity yesterday at the uh, municipal and school uh, focus group. Uh, although due to time constraints, um, I wasn't able to contribute uh, orally during that, but I have submitted an email that represented the town of Newington's thoughts on, on some of these issues. And I understand it will be put up under the comments uh, section of the website. So I direct the commissioners to, to view that uh, correspondence in detail uh, about uh, subject, uh, several, several subject matters, not the least of which I wanna emphasize my colleague, Mark Dakota's um, 
uh, input regarding Waterville Valley. Uh, I think COVID, um, we're, we're all day by day learning not only the health related impacts of COVID and the pandemic, uh, we're also understand, we're beginning to understand that there are uh, social and economic uh, dislocations we never uh, anticipated. So um, a, a word to the wise there in terms of a lot of the assumptions that we may have started off with pre-COVID uh, may not um, work so well uh, post-COVID or as the, co uh, the pandemic continues. Uh, so I caution there. And lastly, uh, in closing, uh, I uh, know the commission has been working on what they've called their Rotary Club speech. Uh, and when that presentation is ready, uh, I've been, been in contact with a number of the uh, former coalition communities, uh, and, and they would like to have the opportunity to have that dialogue uh, with the commission uh, when those presentations are available. Um, so whenever that can be, if we could be added to the list of uh, receiving entities, uh, we we would certainly uh, welcome that, and I could assist in uh, identifying who those communities are. Terrific. Well, thanks very much, Paul. I'm sure we'll be taking you up on that offer. Thank you. Okay. Our Next speaker will be Bridie. Welcome, Bridie. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to thank you for your due diligence and working to address this critical concern. Um, I am Bridie Bellomare, the Executive Director for the New Hampshire Association of School Principals. Uh, we represent close to 600 school leaders, uh, curriculum leaders, uh, deans um, and some representation from some charters across the state. Um, I certainly could echo some of the points my colleagues have previously made as to um, specific items referenced in the funding principles you have before you today. However, I'm here today not to um, propose solutions for the how of the potential reconfigured formula for adequacy funding, but on behalf of our organization, rather to offer testimony from the practitioner's point of view, as a few um, speakers today have also referenced, specifically to offer perspective on how inadequate, uh, inadequate fiscal planning directly impacts teaching and learning. I think we know that communities that are not well resourced to support their schools often lack the basic resources to provide equitable learning opportunities for their students. And in these systems, we can often track an increased rate of educator and school leader turnover, which in turn impacts student learning, school culture, and climate. In these systems, districts encumber additional costs as a direct result of these causes such as ongoing attrition, substitute teacher coverage, and hiring processes, all of which can result in a long-term chronic cycle of student catch-up over a period of years. Fiscal planning should also ensure for effective mentoring and coaching programs, as well as professional learning that is job embedded for both aspiring and current school leaders. This will only serve to strengthen the foundation of teaching and learning and ultimately the overall achievement outcomes in our schools. Again, our purpose here today um, for offering testimony is not to speak about calculations and formulas. However, we do want to be part of the problem solving process. NHASP will be monitoring all legislation around this very critical issue, and we welcome the opportunity to partner with you in your continued problem solving efforts. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Bridie, for, uh, for sharing those, uh, those comments and, uh, and uh, your uh, reaching out today. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker will be Scott. Welcome, Scott. Thank you, uh, Representative Luno and members of the committee. I'm Scott Marion. I'm the executive director of the National Center for the Improvement of Educational Assessment. A, uh, we're a bunch of uh, national, uh, international uh, assessment and accountability experts work in about 40 states nationally. We're based in Dover, New Hampshire. I'm also on the school board, have been on the school board for 
seven and a half years uh, in rye. I thought it was eight and a half years and it was turning off soon. My wife uh, reminded me that I'm miscounting. So uh, another, another year and a half. Easy to lose track when you're on a school board. <laughs> yes. Um, so I just want to um, echo just a couple of things. I, like I said, I, I work in, in many states and I'm embarrassed uh, uh, living here in New Hampshire where we have the most uh, inequitable school funding formula in, in the country by far. And so um, I'm hoping, uh, I'd like to echo what uh, my friend Barrett and, uh, and Megan said about being bold. There's already people going to be sniping at you. We can't do that. We can't afford that. We took the pledge. We don't want that. So this is a chance to lay out a vision for people to, uh, to aim for uh, in future generations and hopefully work to get there uh, closer and closer. But I, I think we have to be bold. And the, just the second thing I'll say, and like I said, I promise to be brief, as I was going through the report, and I know uh, a few of the authors, I, um, the only thing I would urge you in the final report is to ask the uh, researchers to present the research evidence that would support one model over another. So has a particular model uh, shown more efficacy at, for instance, closing achievement gaps or raising the achievement of the, of the typically uh, disadvantaged students compared to another one? If they can't do that, if, uh, you know, they should be able to do that because we do have enough models in the country. Um, for instance, Wyoming has the most equitable system and their students, uh, no offense to Deglin for using the free and reduced lunch, but the kids in poverty uh, perform, you know, second or third highest on a national assessment of educational progress, where statewide, the, the you know, full set of kids is about uh, 10th best. So they, they actually get a, a differential boost on their lowest socioeconomic kids. So I, I would just urge the, uh, the, that you press the report authors to try to, uh, give you at least information, not just present you with a single model, but of models that show different uh, levels of efficacy of, uh, in terms of raising the achievement of the kids we care most about. So um, th I, I know this is a thankless task, but I, I appreciate what, uh, what you all are doing. And I think it was Barrett who said that. I looked at the meeting schedule. I was like, oh, I'll take the school board compared to that. So thank you guys. <laughs> Scott, thanks for your comments, except you know it, nothing in uh, education is a thankless task. That's right, all, that's right. It's all worth every second you put into it. That's so. right. So thanks, Scott. Thanks right. for your work. All right. Our next speaker is Crystal. Welcome, Crystal. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Crystal Parody. I am a city councilor here in Summersworth, and I was um, happy to be a part of the discussion yesterday with municipal leaders and was able to ask a couple of questions uh, to inform my comments today. So first of all, just want to thank you all again for all of the incredible work that you've put in. Um, you know, I've barely been able to keep up with everything that you've put out there. So I know that you've, you've spent really a lot of time look at this. Um, as you probably know, I'm sure our, our residents in Summersworth pay much higher than, than the average property tax rate. It's uh, $27.28 per $1,000 of property value here, and 60% of our city budget goes to our schools. Um, and, and in my time as counselor, I've seen that we've really struggled across all departments at retaining really good employees, especially in our schools. And one of the reasons why um, we have a pretty, uh, we're the smallest city in New Hampshire, so we have a very low uh, number of residents under 12,000, so to run an entire city on, on our property taxes, as we have to do, uh, is pretty challenging, and so in order to keep up with other municipalities um, and not lose really qualified teachers to neighboring cities, um, you know, we're trying to do what we can to keep what we're paying them uh, as high as possible, or, or at least get as close to the average surrounding communities as possible. Um, but of course, our residents really, really feel that anytime we have to, you know, raise our budget, that means some of our residents on fixed incomes 
uh, really, really feel that. So I just want to encourage uh, the members of the commission to um, to not completely discount any revenue solutions based on perception, however historically supported they may be, uh, of the chances of, of the legislator passing it. I know that um, I, had, I had heard that one of the um, factors into making sure that your recommendations are really based on existing revenue sources and just sort of um, um, updating and improving those formulas to achieve a more equitable result, which is, of course, very important. Sounds like it's going to be the main focus there. Um, you know, I would underscore that um, in your final recommendations, an explicitly acknowledged statement, if indeed you believe it to be true, as it sounds like many of you may, that to truly get where we all want to be in terms of equitable access to education um, in the future, new revenue sources should be considered or explored. Um, and again, I understand that your recommendations are mostly limited to existing structures, um, but an explicit acknowledgement in the recommendation when it is presented to the legislature that, um, you know, if you have chosen to limit um, your scope in any way, uh, an explicit acknowledgement of why you've chosen to limit it that way would really help allow for more expansive discussions in the future um, once these more immediate improvements are achieved. So I just want to thank you very much. Um, and that's my comment. Crystal, thanks for uh, thanks for those comments. It's very helpful. So thank you. Great. Thanks. So I think we've heard a lot this afternoon. Um, any, um, any, any comments, um, Val or Bill? Oh, just thanks to the commenters. No, very, no. Yeah, very, very informative. And it's, it's, it's good to get the broad perspective from all around the state and from, from different uh, groups with, with very focused interest in this subject. So it's, always helpful. We have another hand up, so. That we do. So yeah. we just got Jerry's hand. So Jerry, I will bring you in. Jerry, welcome. And it's nice to, uh, nice to see you. Thank you, David. And thank you, members. Uh, this, my name is Jerry Fru with the New Hampshire School Administrators Association. And I was waiting till the very end, uh, in the event that Carl, our executive director, could make this call, but he had an appointment come up late, and I said, I'll wait till the last gun is fired, call, Carl, and then uh, <laughs> weigh in. But uh, given the lateness of the hour, I will not uh, take uh, much of the commission's time other than to thank you for your dedication and your efforts toward this incredibly important work. Uh, we appreciate the legislators who uh, sponsored this study commission to, to get things rolling. Um, and uh, I cannot add a whole lot of wisdom to what has already been put forth and the principles that Mr. McLynch talked about and what, what Bridie and Barrett and Megan have talked about and also with respect to the cities and communities involved with uh, the implications that they face, uh, that all communities face as a result of the decisions of this work. Um, we fully agree that the child's equitable access to education should not be based on the zip code in which they reside. Um, and that we hope and look forward to a, a funding solution and a definition of adequacy that will be adequate uh, for the foreseeable future. And um, again, we just wanna thank uh, the commission for this work and look forward to partnering with you throughout this process, throughout the legislative process and uh, any uh, information that uh, certainly the district leaders can provide. We're happy to jump in and uh, support your work. So thank you for this opportunity. Terrific. Thank, thanks for your, for your comments, Jerry, and, and for your support and for, um, for your commitment to public education in New Hampshire. It's tremendous. So thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, well, great. Well, I think we've come right up to, uh, to the hour. So, uh, so I think it was used pretty, uh, pretty efficiently and pretty effectively. And, um, and uh, it's, it's great to hear, uh, particularly helpful to hear comments when they're, when they're new and fresh and, uh, 
and I think we did uh, we did get a lot of that uh, this afternoon. So um, so anyway, my thanks to everybody that uh, that shared their thoughts um, uh, with us, and for um, uh, for other attendees who who um, who hung along with us and uh, and were able to listen to those uh, listen to those comments and concerns. And uh, what well, we got a we got a busy day tomorrow, right, Bruce? Yeah, full day of work group meetings, starting with fiscal policy at um, uh, ten o'clock. Ten o'clock, um, public engagement at one, and adequacy at three. Yeah. So um, everybody get a good good um, have a good dinner, get a good sleep tonight, and uh, busy day tomorrow. All right, thanks thanks so much. <clears throat> Take care.